We are still dealing with the vestiges of slavery. They were became free labor, their families were separated. Even when I am pulled over, I am nervous. Anybody who says to me, I don't see color, I know they're lying. Still struggling with an issue is not the same as nothing has changed. Well, I wanted to turn the situation that happened to me, a negative one, into a positive. Tonight, 19 News sets out to see how 400 years later, the vestiges of slavery still exist in Cleveland. You'll hear words including slavery, racism, white supremacy. You'll also hear the words truth, resilience, and hope. Black people should watch this series because it will help us understand why we think and act the way we do and how race still plays a major role in our lives. White people should care about this series because it will help you understand your role, even in the 21st century, the way you think about and react to people of color. There have been 400 years of denial, subjugation, segregation, and racism that have impacted America's people of color. This is our attempt to help us all understand and appreciate what was done by whom, to the benefit of whom, and to the detriment of whom. This country's history is complicated. In 1619, the first Africans came to the eastern shores of America. Some say they were enslaved. Others say they were indentured servants. Either way, there is no arguing that an estimated 400,000 Africans endured a life of captivity in North America. Many slaves fled the southern states, headed north for a life of hope. While many in their quest for freedom made their way to Canada, some first came through Ohio. These freedom seekers made their way to Cleveland along the Underground Railroad. Incredible individuals, black and white, risked their lives to help people to freedom. And here were people who had, you know, almost nothing and risked everything for freedom. And that's just so inspiring. Cleveland Public Theater holds an annual event called Station Hope to celebrate the history and to come together as a community. Having uh, a woman who grew up in this neighborhood, a white woman who grew up in this neighborhood, uh, having a 10 minute conversation with a girl who lives in Lakeview Terrace Estates, just a couple blocks north of us here, who performed on stage here, and seeing connections being made for both of them about each other's lives. That kind of bridge building is really what this event's all about. The event is held at St. John's Episcopal Church, or what was known as Station Hope. It is a documented historic underground railroad site. Through these doors, we talk with 90-year-old Joan Southgate. This is the original bell. In 2002, Southgate, then 73, walked the path many escaped slaves took to freedom. I found that once I began, the walking was easy. <laughs> easy for a little old 73-year-old. <laughs> it was easy. So what was that? Spirit. 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 Her 519-mile journey started in Ripley, Ohio, and ended in Canada. Historians say these freedom seekers climbed these narrow steps and hid in this bell tower in fear of getting caught and being sent back south to bondage. It was almost as if there was a silence, an overwhelming feeling of connection. We are still dealing with the vestiges of slavery. Dr. Ronnie Dunn, a professor of urban studies at Cleveland State University, led the way for an entire year of events commemorating 1619. This was important for Cleveland and the community. To look at the history, but look at strategies and solutions to remedying these uh, vestiges of structural racism that are still with us.
life expectancy, uh, health outcomes, uh, wealth, income, education, incarceration, uh, uh, virtually every measure of well-being, African Americans are at or near the bottom. Many experts we talk with outline what they see as the vestiges of slavery. White supremacy. Judge Michael Nelson, Cleveland Municipal Court. So for the vast majority of this country's history, we have lived subservient to white supremacy, to white people. Slavery really resulted in the enrichment of one group and uh, the complete economic disadvantage of another. Reverend Marvin McMickle, former pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland. Ownership of property, access to education, which allows for upward mobility. Um, all of these things uh, continue with us to this day. Would say the news headlines in Cleveland, Ohio are notorious. Authorities say Sowell is a serial killer and have charged him with 11 murders. 12 year old Tamir Rice died today, shot yesterday by a Cleveland police officer. And there's no question that they're disturbing and for many traumatic. It's nice to see the people come out and support these things and stuff, but what's going to happen tomorrow? Many in the black community are suffering from undiagnosed symptoms, including PTSD toxic stress, environmental racism, and unresolved trauma. It took us 400 years to get to this point. The horror of violence is just something that comes to pass and makes a new cycle and then ends. And for them, it is part of their day-to-day -day life, the grief, the rage, the hopelessness. Research shows that adverse childhood experiences are a critical public health issue. Things like abuse, neglect, mental illness can have negative and long-lasting effects on the well-being of a child later in life. These teens talk about some of those issues during meetups with Empowering Youth Exploring Justice, EYEJ, their youth council. I was silent about a lot of stuff I was going through. And we don't think about our young people like dealing with stress, you know, um, with all the different things that go on. The teens told us this space gives them an opportunity to talk about the things on their minds with comfort, including toxic stress, police brutality, social justice, community relations, and what they're going through, and with adults that want to listen. It's definitely healing just to be able to speak your truth to somebody that's not gonna, like you said, like give all these consequences or yeah. try to call the police because those are things that us as kids, like we're scared. I was, okay, I was molested at nine, so that's not something you can just go tell your teacher. Journalist and activist Bakari Kitwana says many of these issues have to be addressed by the national culture. When you start to normalize <laughs> stuff like that, you've lost sense of, uh, of reality, a, a, a society becoming so um, drunk <laughs> with its own power that it loses sight on taking care of its own people. And I feel like that, that's where we are. After 12-year-old Tamir Rice was shot and killed by Cleveland police in 2014, Katwana worked closely with Tamir's mother, Samaria Rice, to keep her son's legacy alive through the Tamir Rice Foundation. How do you have a society in which uh, a young boy playing in a park can be killed and, the, and there is really no resolution or people think the resolution is give his family some money, um, but yet we still have the conditions that persist that will allow for children like this to be killed again and people to be killed again and no one to be held accountable. Licensed social worker Rashid Grimes says we can all be traumatized from seeing so many images of horrible and dangerous conditions, especially for people who look like yourself. She says adults need to set aside technology and monitor media to protect the children.
We don't have a larger uproar and sense of responsibility from the broader community when four young people are found uh, murdered. That would, in a different community, raise such a level of engagement from our elected officials and from our, our national uh, media and other entities who suggest how important you are. Because, you know, pain shared is pain lessened. So I got to work with officers on a, on a closer basis, a more, you know, personal basis. And I was like, you guys aren't all bad. Oh my goodness, you're some amazing individuals, you know, and some beautiful people. Sergeant Charmin Leone is the officer in charge of public safety recruitment for Cleveland. As she advanced in her police career, she had to face another, more sinister reality, racism. It's heartbreaking. Of course I've seen it. She ran into a culture that shocked and disturbed her often hidden behind the blue shield, racism. It manifested itself in a way some white police officers treat African Americans. Officers fired 137 shots at two unarmed suspects inside a vehicle, killing both of them. She died saying the Lord's Prayer, so we're hoping that, you know, Tanisha's words is still with, with God. I'm in this fight for justice for Tamir. People need to know, even when I am pulled over, I am nervous. But my heart is still at the same time being like this. Sergeant Leon knows mistreatment didn't start in modern day police departments. When we talk about the vestiges of slavery, you know, when we talk about modern day policing in the United States was born out of slave patrols. As if we had a ball and chain on us, a physical ball and chain that became a mental ball and chain. Cleveland Municipal Court Judge Michael Nelson is the former president of the Cleveland NAACP. He has fought for equal rights as a lawyer and as a civil rights leader for decades. To the extent that even after slavery ended, there were those of us who were more comfortable living under the uh, the rule of white Americans as opposed to us taking advantage of the opportunity that we had to be free. That also exists even to this day when we see, you see people saying, well look, voting doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change for us. Even after nearly 250 years of slavery, ways were created to keep blacks in the South under the thumb of white landowners. De facto slavery by another name, Jim Crow. White supremacy. The long-term consequences is that we have a society that is inherently, inherently unequal based on race. The practices of controlling and over-policing blacks may have had their roots in the distant past, but there are present-day effects that threaten America's black and brown. There's a cops with guns pointed at every window in my car. Levite Pierre recalls getting pulled over and the terror he and his friends felt and the emotional and mental scars they still carry because of a life-threatening traffic stop. It's me, Obasi, and like two other young black men. One of my friends um, is just the whole time hands up saying like, please don't shoot me, please don't shoot me. Um, me, I'm just like in disbelief that I'm looking down the barrel of a gun for the first time in my life. And like, you know, in that instant, I'm just thinking like, my life isn't up to me anymore, you know? They can just like, I can move wrong and die. The threat and fear are real. A Cleveland program empowering youth, exploring justice brings police and youth together to talk. Like just because they're perceived a certain way on television or perceived like that, we shouldn't be afraid of them. Just like we perceive a certain way on TV, they shouldn't be afraid of us. And 99% of us, we don't want to be perceived as a warrior. Because honestly, at the end of the day, I'm just like you. I, I could honestly tell you, as a law enforcement officer, I wasn't always wearing this uniform. You know what I mean? I was a kid once, and I used to hate police once, too. You know what I mean? I didn't talk to them, I, you know? So I, I feel when they come from that way, but it also hurts when I see the fact that at home, they're not changing that either. Because on one hand, we have children, and on the other hand, we have adults. Right. So I believe it's the adults who need to take that step first because there are different consequences for us, our consequences, our lives. Right. For, for a lot of police officers, there is no consequence. Because once we understand each other, then we know how to uh, handle situations and come to a solution and how to work together. 
the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported in 2014, black males accounted for 34% of the total male prison population. That's five times the incarceration rate of whites. There are many factors, poor education, fewer good jobs leading to poverty. You cannot put every problem outside of the control of the black community. Uh, white racism does not necessarily cause a father to abandon their children. Sergeant graduated almost six years ago, but she'll never forget experiences in the classroom that shaped her views of race and inequality. When I was in elementary school, I was called an Oreo. Um, I was in high school, I was one of only one of the only black students in my AP or IB classes. Tiara went to Shaker Heights schools, a diverse community with a proud history of integration and acceptance, but she says they can do better. So being that student, I wanted to help or come back and help and support other minority students. And also She's now an advisor for SCORE, the student group on race relations, with about 300 students of all backgrounds. So these students are able to take the conversations that we're having and to the dinner table and talk to their parents about that. And um, their parents um, might have a light bulb that goes off and they might do something in their communities. Students like Isaac Weiss meet every week and talk to students in fourth grade and up throughout the school year. I think what's opened my eyes the most is the way in which people can change. I think there's a stigma that, that everybody is very solid in their views. The achievement gap and how to overcome it is a focus of their discussion. So I think that, that when classes become racially, uh, racially segregated, honestly, uh, I think that, that we lose that, that key part of diversity, which is the integration. ProPublica found black and Hispanic students across the country are less likely to be in gifted programs and AP courses than white students. Some students need that extra push to succeed from their teachers, and studies show many aren't getting it. Just 20 percent of the nearly 4 million public school teachers across the country are teachers of color compared to 51 percent of students. Black students make up 15 percent of the population, but just 7 percent of teachers. Black principals are more likely to hire and retain black teachers, but just 10 percent of public school principals are black. So why does representation matter? A recent report found teachers of color help close achievement gaps and they're positively perceived by students of all races. Teachers of color boost test scores, improve graduation rates and encourage students of color to consider college at higher rates. Tiara says the five teachers of color she had at school are still a part of her life today. The education system was created by white educators. So what we are teaching our teachers um, might not fit every student and especially minority students. So really taking a step further and educating yourself on diversity inclusion and different tactics of how you can reach minority students. This is not their mission. This is our mission. This is why we were created. This is why we're still needed today. Cynthia Warwick, president of Stillman College in Alabama, in Ohio, recruiting students, spoke about the importance of historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. We give students the nurturing environment, the small, caring environment. We care whether you learn or not. Tiara experienced this firsthand as a graduate of Hampton University, an HBCU. You just feel like um, someone cares about you and you can really talk to, like there's a one barrier that's uh, removed from that relationship. David Glasner, the new superintendent of Shaker Heights Schools, wants to change the issues in his district. We want to make sure that once we hire candidates that they also want to stay in Shaker, especially candidates of color, teacher candidates of color, administrators and other staff and faculty. They're focusing on recruitment and retention. Glasner says they've seen some gains. They've also tried to reach students in other ways. We want to make sure that our curriculum is diverse and it represents opportunities for students to see themselves and to understand their potential in our society. 
The district's new educational equity policy focuses on black student excellence. They're hosting community workshops and meetings on race and education, and all teachers are training on racism. We have to bring our community along with, with this work and with these conversations. Uh, it's why engagement of our community is so important. Isaac is graduating this year. He wants to be a teacher who passes on what he learned from SCORE. I think for a teacher to be able to start the conversation and to create that safe space uh, and to express to students that it's okay to have these tough conversations. And Tiara has this hope for the future of black students' education. That educators are not uh, colorblind to students, however, that we are able to see that every student has something excellent within them and that we push them to excel uh, to their greatest potential and level. You can learn more about educational equity at Shaker Heights Schools on Cleveland19.com. If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. when you do to little white children for a day the same thing that we do to black children for a lifetime. Watch and see how these little white children respond to being treated unfairly on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they have absolutely no control. I thought I wasn't a racist because I said I wasn't. And then I watched my third graders demonstrating all the behaviors and saying the words that they had learned from the significant adults in their environment. We've changed the way a couple of, of, of corporations run their business because their people have gone through the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise and they're saying, we're not going to do that. We're not, going to, we're not going to allow you to treat certain groups of people unfairly. I've been hit by a white male during the exercise, an adult white male. I've had a knife pulled on me. I've had been threatened with death several times. There are lots of different color groups. There are 2,500 different skin colors on the face of the earth. Now, if you have time to make up 2,500 different names for racists, you've got too much time on your hands. You need to do something positive with your life. And the first thing you need to do is realize that there's only one race. It's the human race. God created the human race, one race, the human race. Human beings created racism. But when you say, I don't see color, that's a lie. And I know that anybody who says to me, I don't see color, I know they're lying. They're in the state of denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. It's what white people do all the time. White people think that Black Lives Matter, that statement really bothers them because they think it means only black lives matter. You can solve that problem by simply make some, making signs that say, black lives matter too. Mm -hmm. Just add one more word to that sign. Instead of letting white people criticize you for saying something that they don't understand, make it impossible for them to say, well, that means only black lives matter. It's probably really scary to think that any person of color 
has something to learn from me. Every black woman has forgotten more since breakfast than I will ever learn about racism. In the land of the free and the home of the brave, I'm free. Black women are brave. My heroes are black women because they keep on keeping on no matter what we do to them. Education can make the difference. If we really decide to educate, we'll turn this thing around in two generations. I don't have a single doubt in my mind about that. And we'd better. For African Americans, the church represents so much more than just religion. It has been the epicenter of the struggle for generations. Well, recently, we sat down with a group of men and women of faith to see if the church has lost its way with the community. The African American church has sustained the moral, spiritual, and even survival process of the African American community. This, this does not mean that the church has been perfect and on point at every step of the way. With God, all things are possible. When the world told us we were nobody, particularly for our men, when the world said that they were nobody, that they didn't have a title, that they were boy, the church said, you're somebody. The idea was we're not going to be second class citizens in the church because there were positions they could not hold, uh, things they could not own or do in larger white church settings. I met Dr. King as a student at Morehouse College where he had attended. So you could not attend Morehouse without becoming acquainted with the King family. So when I met him, it was an obligation, it was a calling. This was never the majority of people who were doing this. 90% of the black pastors in that convention sat out the civil rights movement. How can we uh, in any way not address what is happening in the world if Jesus was addressing what was happening in the world? You don't have to be mega to have mega thinking. And if you talk to anybody too long, you start saying his name. You can't go 15 minutes and not mention the name of Jesus. I've never forgotten where I come from. I'm a boy from the projects of Cleveland. There's no way God put me here in the city I was born in not to make a difference. That would be a tragedy. Jesus is real. Bring your families, bring your friends, bring your children. Let's take our community back. Every Sunday is not about social justice, but not to speak about a Tamir Rice. God is a God of justice. He's a God of mercy, but he also wants justice for the least of these. When, when Michael Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri, the black church did not respond. Young black people did. Over time, people just find ways to live without you. The Black Lives Matter movement is proof of that. The miracle is what? You ain't let go of your faith yet. Some black churches um, maybe are more fearful of what are the results of what does it mean to stand up and protest. Some of it is that disconnect from the historical reality of who we started out as. And if we are not uh, a station for liberation, really we have no vital purpose for our being, our existence. And that's what the church has to be. Uh, not a building, but a community of people who are attempting to move a group of people who survived racism to a group of people who are able to thrive in American democracy. It is critical that church leaders come together in clergy groups, for example, and discuss the issues that are happening in the community. Then to reach out to the community leaders, civic leaders, 
call them to accountability. Sometimes it's not just about protesting. Sometimes it's about radically loving people that other people don't love. Sometimes it's about revolutionary and radically serving people that other people do not serve. And then other times it is about being radical enough to speak the truth to, power, to the powerful and then speak truth for the powerless. I think the answer is the church has got to be a lot more proactive and, and put something at risk by stepping outside the door. The philosophy, simple, making the most of your current situation, a message of hope not lost on 14-year-old Janoa Lee. Well, the racial bullying incident that happened to me, it was very traumatic for me and very, very upsetting. Janoa is biracial. He had to be homeschooled after constant bullying by a fellow classmate. After a couple of investigations, his father pursued legal action, but Janoa chose to cast down his bucket. I didn't want to take that route. I wanted to turn it into a positive. And that he did. Born out of personal pain, he created his own clothing line, Urban Stereotype. And I notice in the logo you have us in there. Yeah. Just talk about the significance of that. Um, the significance about my logo is that not only does it stand for Urban Stereotype, it actually spells out the word us. And us is very important for not only what my brand is trying to do, but what it's trying to accomplish, you know, bringing all of us together. Quite a fashion statement. The team once singled out at school now uses his talent to promote unity. He has turned his negative racial bullying situation into a positive business model. Once you tie the tie, you're going to get you a job and you're going to be the boss. And then I can get an application and I can work for you. Stanley Gordon wearing the bow tie and Sam Long developed a plan to inspire the next generation based off of this philosophy. along with personal struggles growing up in Cleveland. I've been pulled over, you know, before, harassed by several cops and, um, you know, just the way people perceive us. So that's why we started Let's Tie the Knot to teach young men how to become gentlemen. Let's Tie the Knot, a metaphor for bridging the gap between kids and adults in the African-American community. Over the years, the organization has donated cleats I'll take a and a half. to local high school football team. Make sure y'all come out tomorrow giving book bags to students, even dressed as Santa passing out toys to children of single mothers, a deed that has special meaning to Stanley. I used to be in foster care, and when I was younger, I remember my foster mom taking us to a center, and it was a guy who looked just like me, and he was giving out toys. And I remember getting this truck, this little toy, toy truck, and that day I said, you know what, I want to be that guy. Now take this one and fold it over. As for the ties, they've passed out thousands, taught more than 1,500 young men how to tie a knot, a skill that will benefit these boys as they become men. It's our responsibility to give them wisdom, knowledge, understanding, a good solid foundation so when trials, when the rains come, they can be prepared to get through a storm. If a picture is worth a thousand words, the work of these five artists speak volumes about their reality. I have a speech impediment, so it was always difficult to explain myself back when I was younger. And um, yeah, music is the only expression I really had. I will always watch my parents, and they will always watch the news, and the news never has anything like positive. It's always a negative, negative, somebody died, another black person got shot. So it's like for me, creating my artwork is a way to really enjoy living life. Another local organization offering hope, shooting without bullets. The metaphor here, artists use cameras as creative tools, not weapons. Art really is that vehicle and catalyst for change, and it's just so darn beautiful that even if you don't agree with it, you're simply mesmerized by the fact that a human being created something so complex and, and, and gorgeous. Their artwork, in some cases, therapeutic. It was actually in honor of my grandmother who passed away a little over a month ago. I wanted to do something in remembrance of her, so I snapped a bunch of pictures of her already while we had to go down south to even make all those arrangements and stuff, but I was like, I'm going to take a bunch of pictures and I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I just found a way to put it in my work. Artistic expression, young entrepreneurs, and philanthropy, just ways young people right here in Cleveland are cultivating 
levitating, educating, validating, elevating, liberating, advocating, navigating, and demonstrating there's hope for the future generation. During Black History Month, you've been watching our series on 400 years of vestiges of slavery in Cleveland. We've sat down with educators, law enforcement, clergy, journalists, social workers, and students to talk about these important issues, including race, education, trauma, policing, and spirituality. The question now is, where do we go from here? Let's hear about our hopes for the future. What's my hope? That's a good question. My hope for Black America is that we take, we understand the importance of reinvesting our youth and teaching entrepreneurship, giving them those hands-on skills to be able to take ownership and control of their own destiny. My hope is that Black America will, we will experience peace, a sense of hope and optimism. My hope for Black America is to continue to realize how beautiful and powerful we are. My hope for Black America is that we recognize who we are and um, we, um, we let the mental shackles of slavery off of us and we strive for economic independence. My hope is a black America where we all thrive. Um, truly where the color of your skin or um, your socioeconomic status, the neighborhood you're born into doesn't dictate what your destiny is. My hope for black America is that the black church, the African American church, will always be the prophetic voice. A prophetic simply meaning uh, a tradition that is concerned about uh, the vulnerable. My hope for black America is that black America will recognize that it is a gift from God, uh, that our community, uh, we are not three-fifths of a person, that we never forget who we are, and that the black church would sustain what uh, Dr. King and many others uh, tried to stop. So there's hope for the future because they are going to be in the majority in the future. We have to pray that they don't want to treat us the way we have treated them. We've survived. We've survived some tremendous odds. And that in and of itself gives me hope that we will be successful. My hope for us would be how are we using our creativity, our ingenuity, our resources to build up the black community because we have, I think, everything that we need. My hope is that our young people can have lives in which they can, they can dream and that roadblocks won't be put in their way. I'm excited because I see future student government association presidents. I see presidents of colleges and universities. I see me. It's about legacy and I think it's going to start with somebody like me and someone else who look like me and we're going to just keep continue to build every single day. We will not succumb to the stereotypes and the rhetoric um, that we are unable to do that we are less than. If we just change our mindset and learn to love ourselves for who we are and get that in our mind, that is going to take us far. My hope for black America is that we will engage our children in education for liberation and not just education for the perpetuation of the status quo. That in short though inadequate is my hope. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave, and so I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.